Hey guys, welcome back to the shop. Thanks for being here. As always, I'm really excited about this project. What's new, right? Well, today I am forging a, an integral knife from a piece of 52100 steel. It's a 7 8 inch round bar stock. And uh, an integral knife is something that's forged from a single piece of steel. So the blade, the bolster, and the tang are all one piece of steel. So essentially you can make a knife from just two pieces of material, i.e. the steel and then maybe like a chunk of wood for the handle. So that's, that's kind of cool. So in this version of the video here, the, this is a little longer version, I'm going to focus on the metallurgical and, uh, you know, just the forging of this blade, the heat treating process for 52100 steel. So basically I'm going to focus on 52100 steel in this video. And at the end of this video I have some testing on this knife. And so in the other version, which is shorter, that's more focused on the aesthetics, the, the, the actual mechanics of forging the blade, so forth. So uh, per that theme, let's get right into it. 52100 steel, what is it? It is bearing steel. It's been around for over a hundred years and it was originally developed for bearings, ball bearings, roller bearings, etc. And it's probably most commonly recognized in the form of ball bearings. And uh, that's, what it's, that's what it's used for. So it has some great characteristics though that can, that can make a really good knife blade. And so that's, that's our interest in it. Another really just practical aspect to 52100 steel is the availability uh, just the availability at all, it's very easy to get, but also the availability in different uh, material sizes and dimensions. Um, there's a lot of different good knife steels, and there's some really great knife steels that are very difficult to get or are very difficult to get in um, you know, certain, certain sizes or dimensions. And so, you know, 5200 steel being an industrial steel for bearings, it's very common and ubiquitous, you might say, and so it's easy to get. Not only is it easy to get, it's easy to get in things like round stock, which is not true of many other knife steels. And so that's one just simple practical reason that you might be interested in 5200 steel. And for me personally, that was an aspect of it. But more to the point and more importantly are, are the characteristics that this steel is capable of. So let's look at it on paper for a minute. So it has 1% carbon, which is a high carbon steel. It's a hyper eutectoid steel, which means it's more carbon than 0.77%. And it also has about 1.5% chromium. And then, of course, some other minor alloying elements that are uh, important to the um, processing of the steel but don't play huge roles in the uh, overall you know, heat treatment of the steel, except for like the manganese and stuff. But those are pretty, um, pretty standard so, to, to most modern steels. So the, the hyper-eutectoid steel, uh, like I say, it's over 0.77% in, in the uh, chemical composition of the steel. The reason that's important is that the the carbon beyond 0.77% um, um, acts as uh, iron or excuse me carbides in the in the steel after heat treatment if it's heat treated properly, and that's important because it provides abrasion resistance, which is also incidentally one of the uh, characteristics that was desired for this intended use, which was bearings. And also that's a, obviously a good thing to have in a knife blade because, you know, when you're cutting through whatever you're cutting through, scraping through, you know, whatever you're scraping through, um, the abrasion resistance is an important uh, element to edge retention in a knife. Uh, the hardness of a blade is basically going to be, uh, or I should say the hardness of the martensite in a blade or in any, in any steel is going to be you know, basically the equivalent once you reach, uh, I believe it's about 0.5% carbon. Anything beyond that doesn't really make the blade any harder uh, in, in and of the, itself. Once you start adding uh, those carbides from the excess carbon, that can make the blade harder, but also more abrasion resistant. So that's, that's the reason for the additional carbon. Um, the chromium does, mainly what it does is it uh, slows diffusion in the steel, which does several things for us. First of all, during the uh, initial heat treat process, um, you have to be aware that it's going to take more time in, in specific temperatures to get uh, what you need done in this steel. So through normalizing, for example, uh, I normalized this at uh, 1625 degrees, which is a little higher than something like, say, uh, you know, 1095 or 1080, something like that. And the reason for that is you, you need to have a high enough temperature to get things into solution and move, move to where they need to be, but not so high that you, you start you know, causing issues. 
So because there's chromium content in there, that kind of slows things up a little bit and you have to compensate with that with a little bit more temperature, but more specifically, uh, some more time. So it's uh, things like grain growth and um, the bad distribution of, of carbon or carbides is more affected by the temperature than it is time. So you can hold, you know, hold this steel at 1625 for 15 minutes, minutes, which is important. And you're not really, you're not going to have adverse um, effects to that, but it's, but the steel is going to be able to do what it needs to do. So I normalized the 1625 and that gets everything uh, stress relieved and kind of homogenized again after the, um, the forging process, which kind of wreaks havoc on the internal structure of the steel. And then I followed that with a cycle at 1500 degrees, I held that for 15 minutes and then 1450. Typically I do, um, typically I do four thermocycles, but um, further study on this, I don't think it's necessarily necessary. Uh, and so I tried it with just three. A lot of guys do just three. But one of the things about the chromium is that it does uh, keep the grain size down, which is another good thing. So you can see me putting this into a dry ice quench now that I've quenched it in oil. And, and for the record, I used Parks 50, which technically isn't necessary. Um, and medium fast oil should be sufficient, something like a triple A. Um, the only thing I have besides the Parks 50 is an 11 second oil, which is on just on the outer edge of, of the speed um, that it should be. So I didn't want to risk, you know, not getting uh, as much Martensitic conversion as possible. So one of the problems that people run into with 52100 and other high carbon steels, um, basically any steel, but the higher the carbon, is retained austenite. And what that is, is that when you heat the steel up to austenitic temperature prior to the quench, it's, it's austenite and you have to cool that fast enough to keep it from converting to perlite, which is not a good knife material. And then if you do that, it continues to cool down and it eventually uh, turns into martensite, but not all of it. There's always a small percentage of the steel that stays austenite, which contains more carbon and um, it, it is a malleable soft form or, um, form a phase of steel. And so it doesn't make a good knife blade. Now, now there's, that's unavoidable. You're not going to get 100% martensitic conversion in a normal uh, knife blade. And that's kind of an accepted fact. The question is, is how much can we improve that through a sub-zero quench to make it worthwhile? Uh, sub-zero quench, that's simply dry ice, uh, powdered or crushed in a, in a um, mineral spirit slurry. So you mix those together. And that gets the blade down to negative, about negative 95 degrees. And that allows that further conversion of that retained austenite into martensite. And you follow that with the temper. And then I put it back in the dry ice and to temper it a second and final time. And then you're done. Now, this should not be necessary for adequate or um, good performance in 52100 steel. And the reason is, is because if we are controlling our temperatures properly, uh, we shouldn't be putting any more than about 0.7 or 0.8% carbon into solution prior to the quench. And again, like I mentioned, like I alluded to a, a minute ago, the way that that is controlled <clears throat> is primarily through temperature and to some degree time, um, but mostly temperature. The, common, the commonly uh, recommended austenizing temperature for 52100 is 1550 degrees. However, you're going to get uh, a little more retained austenite um, if you go that high. I, I austenized at uh, 1485 and held for 15 minutes at that temperature. And so if you're going to, um, if you're going to austenize at a lower temperature, you do have to have that extra time for everything to go into solution that you want to. And so for this reason, 52100 is not a good steel if you only have a forge or some kind of simple um, heat treating uh, facility like that. If you have a forge that you can put a thermocoupler in in a, a heat well or whatever and get a, a consistent heat that you can hold for extended periods of time, then that should work. I, I personally have not delved into that, but some, some way to hold a specific consistent heat is going to be crucial to the heat treatment of 52100 if you want to get anything near the performance that it should get. So that's just a little side note there. So, um, yeah, so anyway, that's what I did. And 
the reason I did the dry ice quench is because several years ago I um, sort of I'd heard about 52100 steel, but I, I finally saw it on paper for the first time, and I was like, oh my goodness, a high you know it's a little more carbon than 1095, and then you got some chromium in there for you know some some great uh, attributes, and I was like, I got all excited. And, and I tried, if I made several blades to test it out and try to get to dial in a heat treat. And looking back, there were several things that probably um, contributed to the poor performance of the, of the steel of the blades that I made. Um, and so anyway, I, I wasn't happy with it and it, it turned out very, very tough, but it didn't, did not hold an edge like it should have or as well as you know the other knives that I was making out of like 1095 and 01 and stuff. And so I kind of bagged it and um, I did some more study on it you know, over the next couple of years and I heard a lot of people using um, the Sub-Zero Quench to address the uh, retained austenite issue. And then I did some more study and came across, or didn't come across, but I, I went and saw what Kevin Cashin had to say on it. Who, I don't, if you don't know who Kevin Cashin is, uh, if you're interested in bladesmithing metallurgy at all, you need to know who he is. He's basically the, the guru when it comes to practical bladesmithing metallurgy. Anyway, he um, enlightened me through, not directly, but through his information that you can find on his websites and in various different forum posts online, that if you control the amount of carbide that you, or carbon that you put into solution prior to the quench, then you're going to minimize and, and control that amount of retained austenite. And so the idea is that there's not going to be enough retained austenite to um, make a sub-zero quench really worth it to get that much more performance. However, this time around, I had some dry ice on hand because I had, um, I had to do a couple of stainless blades, some AEBL blades, which, which is necessary to use a sub-zero quench. And so I was like, hey, I'm going to try 52100 because I'd found this round stock and bought a couple pieces. And so basically for me, this is like, all right, I'm going to see if I can make a good blade from 52100 and then, you know, sort of backtrack from there. And so the next time I do this, I'm going to uh, eliminate the dry ice quench and, and, and keep everything else the same. Make sure I'm doing that as well as possible. And I think, I think, I think we're there, but that remains to be seen. So the point is, is that making a good blade out of 52100 is my goal here. And so if you use a dry ice quench, um, you know, more power to you, it, it, it only can help. Let me put it this way. I have, I have uh, dry ice quenched um, like 01 tool steel blades and stuff. Essentially any hyper eutectoid steel is going to benefit to some degree with a sub-zero quench, period. The, the question is how much and is it really worth it? Um, so anyway, that's, um, that's kind of the story there, but you know, again, you shouldn't have hardly any retained austenite to deal with or to worry about if you're doing the heat treatment process, um, properly. Another thing I will note is that the first time that I tried 52100 steel, they were not forged blades and they were, they were stock removal. I went through the uh, multiple, um, normalizing and thermocycling process, um, similar to this one, a little bit different. Um, but the difference is not that it's forged. If there's any difference, I think it would be the fact that it's heat cycled so many times during the forging process. And that's going to um, do things to the carbides that isn't going to happen um, to that same level in, in a stock removal blade. And so if there's any difference between the two processes, that would be it. So as I mentioned a minute ago, uh, the main thing that chromium does is slow diffusion. And so um, let's talk about that for a minute. One of the things that that does is it slows the necessary uh, quench time uh, when we're hardening the steel. And, and that's actually a good thing. So take 1095, for example. It does not have any alloying components beyond some manganese, and, and, and that's about it, really. It has about 0.95% carbon, and the rest is iron. And so to quench that, or to get that hardened fully, you have to bring that steel from austenizing temperature, which is about 1500 degrees, 1475, somewhere in there, down to, uh, I think it's about 900 degrees or below in less than a second. So that's a very fast quench time that's necessary to keep it from starting to transform into perlite, which is a mixture of ferrite and cementite and is not a good blade material. 
uh, relatively tough, but not a good blade material. And so that's a very fast punch. So um, by contrast, for example, 01 tool steel, it's like five seconds, something like that, that you, maybe a little more, I don't even remember now, but it's, it's far, far longer. And so you can use a much slower quenching oil, but it's, uh, it's much simpler in, in the regards to the quench to get it to harden fully. And so it's known as what's called a deep hardening steel. So 52100 with that 1.5% one, one chromium, it's not a deep hardening steel. It does bring that uh, quench time out to about two and a half or three seconds. So not nearly as of a time crunch as 1095, but still certainly not a deep hardening steel like 01 tool steel. So what that does is that helps us um, in the quench and like I mentioned, I believe a minute ago, I did use Parks 50s, probably not necessary, um, but it's definitely going to get to its full possible hardness under those conditions. So going into uh, tempering, once we've completed our hardening process, um, the chromium still provides benefits by um, slowing the, the uh, diffusion of carbon during the tempering process. So what tempering does is it releases some of the carbon from the martensite, martensitic uh, phase of steel, and that goes just goes into the matrix and resides as fine carbides, and that's what um, overall brings up the hardness of the steel, but um, uh, benefits it by contributing to the abrasion resistance that I mentioned earlier. And so the, the chromium, in this case, helps keep those carbides small. So that's good for several reasons. It helps keep the steel tough. The larger the carbides present, the, the lower the toughness in the overall steel. Um, also, it, it helps, uh, it gives you ability to put a very keen edge on the steel because again, the larger the carbides, the less of the ability you have to put a keen edge on a steel, which is the complaint of some high alloy, um, stainless steels that's another subject and so this this uh that this steel has the ability to take a very keen edge and, and hold it well so that's a couple things that the chromium uh, does in this steel so putting an edge on the blade and as i alluded to a second ago i was able to put a very keen edge on this blade which is a which was a encouraging sign uh, for my my heat treat process because like I think I mentioned uh, that indicates that those carbides in that martensitic structure are fine and that's what we want so it's shaving sharp very sharp and now it's time to do a highly scientific test cutting up a bunch of cardboard so <laughs> this is not scientific at all. But cardboard is a, it's a pretty abrasive material in and of itself, and also the fact that this has been sitting around in the shop with, and it's got all kinds of dust and dirt and grit on it, um, that kind of can wreak havoc on a knife, on, on a knife edge. And so, point of reference, um, you can go watch other people cut cardboard with various different knives and knife steels. But I've been able to get over 300 cuts with my 1095 and 15 and 20 uh, Damascus or pattern welded steel blades. And, you know, those have a carbon content that's, you know, a combined carbon content that's less than 0.95%, somewhere between that and 0.8%. So I'm expecting a better results out of this 52100 steel that's up at 1% carbon. And um, the added benefits of the uh, chromium in our overall heat treat process. 46. So the basic idea here is to see how many cuts I can make on an approximately five inch section of cardboard across the corrugation uh, before it won't shave hair anymore. 100. Still shaves, mostly. Still cuts paper. Let's continue on. So after it doesn't shave anymore, which it doesn't now, I want to see how far I can go before it won't really cut paper. And then after that, 
you know how far I can go before it won't really cut cardboard, i.e. start snagging it. And again, this is only sort of relevant in relation to other blades or blade steels, uh, but hey, it is what it is. Yeah, it doesn't shake. Not in the spots that I'm using it for cutting the paper cardboard. So a knife doesn't have to be extremely sharp to cut paper, but it does, it will get to a point where it won't cut paper, and that's what we're going for, so uh, it still cuts paper. So this is the wrong spot in the video, but I forgot to mention a couple things about forging 52100 at the appropriate time earlier. So it forges quite easily, but you do need to keep it up at a good temperature for this steel, which is you know between 1700 and 2000 degrees for forging 52100. 206, so let's see what it does with the paper. Yep. Still cuts through it pretty decent. Now it is very noticeable as you're forging, once it starts to drop kind of below that uh, temperature range, it starts to really stiffen up more than other steels will, especially something like 1080 or 1075. And as with any steel, there is a point at which you should not be forging it or you are running the risk of damaging it. 300. not really wanting to exactly cut the paper very well now. You can make it do it, but it's not happy about it. So I ran out of cardboard at 323 cuts and then my camera stopped. So um, some more cardboard here. So at this point I'm just going until the knife won't cut the cardboard. So anyway, to kind of wrap up the notes on forging 52100, um, you know, it's not, it's, you're not going to be able to get away with hitting it at the same temperature that you will like 1080. 1080 is very forgiving down below, you know, optimal forging temperatures, whereas something that's got a high carbon content like this and in some alloying components, low alloy content as well. Um, you run the real risk of uh, damaging the steel, um, you know, through micro fractures and kind of that kind of thing that you may not see at all until potentially after the quench. So that's just something to keep in mind as you're forging this and and other steels that are, you know, high in carbon content and have and have these alloy components to them. Work out a little harder. It still hasn't snagged. So it's still cutting it. That was what, 360, 362, something like that. And it started to snag. And granted, it's still. It still catches the fingernail. It's still sharp. I mean, you could still, it, well, I, now that I say that, I wonder if I just had some crud on the edge. Camera stopped again. Um, what were we at, 375? I don't know, it's uh, still going. I wasn't counting that, whoops. Ah, hold on. So you're probably familiar with the idea or the fact that there's so many things in bladesmithing that are a give and take kind of a thing. So like on, on a blade steel, we want uh, hardness and abrasion resistance, but we also want toughness. And in fact, those two together play an important role in edge retention. And so we're always trying to kind of find the best of both worlds. I don't know guys, I'm, <laughs> this is pretty awesome, this is working. Very well. I don't, 
kind of ran out of cardboard. So for example, you can have really great abrasion resistance and or hardness, but with the extreme pressure that a knife edge is under, if you don't have toughness to go along with that, to withstand that pressure, and, and the edge ends up fracturing or crumbling or um, you know chipping, the abrasion resistance that you have really isn't doesn't really matter that much. Ooh, there's a snag. Four seven. <coughs> Four seventy. Five hundred. Five hundred. And while it still goes through the cardboard, it takes a little more effort, a fair amount of effort, and I have had a few snags, but it is working very well. And so on that note, I'm going to employ a version of the brass rod test here to give an indication of how we're doing with the toughness versus hardness slash abrasion resistance. Well, specifically toughness versus hardness. So you can see that I'm rolling this quarter inch brass pin on a flat surface here. And you can see the edge of the knife flexing up in the light there. And then, of course, returning to straight. Now, um, this particular blade is not super thin it's kind of a general use blade so unlike something like a you know a fine chef's knife or something like that we would get a little more flex there but I, but you have to put quite a bit of pressure on there to get it to flex like that and if it chips then that's an indication that you need to do something different if if it if only temper it out a little bit more so anyway there you have it guys that is the latest update installment on my my journey in uh, mastering 52100. And like I mentioned earlier, the next time it's going to be Sans uh, uh, Sub-Zero Quench, and we'll see how that goes. But really happy with the way this knife turned out. I'm excited about the possibilities of 52100 steel. Basically, like I say, I have to get to the point where I can get some really good um, performance out of this steel without the dry ice quench because... I don't want to go get dry ice every time I have to heat treat a blade. That's just not practical. Anyway, thanks guys for watching, and we will see you on the next video.